today we are talking about small YouTubers that I think you should watch. Next one is Sam Angle. Sam Angle makes monthly vlogs or what other people call pretentious monthly scrapbooks. He makes it feel like a very unpretentious but carefully made film and I, I'll go right ahead and say it guys, I think it's the future of YouTube. It's a big statement but I'm sticking by it. Hello and welcome to youtube.com slash the future of YouTube. And as per, I'm running very, very behind, very late. I like doing a yearly wrap up of my favorite films from the previous year, last year being 2018. Yes, this is six months late. You might think I've been lazy and um, yeah, you'd be right. But I guess I just didn't see that many films in 2018. Let me explain why. So here's why I didn't see many films this year. A big reason is that I'm in my third year and I'm doing films, so I'm making films and I'm watching a lot of films. And it's kind of like that gynecology joke from Friends. You know, if I just see one more cup of coffee, out of context, that probably makes no sense at all. But I, I guess what I'm saying is uh, being surrounded by films so much, it doesn't feel like personally I've missed out on a lot of watching films. I just haven't seen things necessarily from the, the year we were in and no longer in because that was last. I'm very late. I'm very behind. I could also throw money in there. Money is a big factor as a student. It costs five pounds a ticket and there's 11,000 films released each year roughly. So that's 55,000 pounds. I can't afford that. Here's just a few of the films that I didn't see this year. Take it away, robot, robot man. Okay. First reformed at Eternity's Gate. This man. Sharplifters to the widow to the wall. Bad times at the El Casino Royale. Burn baby burn. Can you ever forgive Mel Gibson? Black clan of a man. Minding the fact the sisters, brothers, uncles, father, son, a star was born. Lean on Pete when you're not strong. 95. Okay, Google. Annihilation. Green book. Leave no trace. Disturbia. Three identical spangles. Bohemian Rhapsody. Bohemian. <laughs> Captain America, Civil Cold War, Ballad of Buster Rhymes, The Haters Going to Hate, The Kindergarten Teacher. I can imagine that many of these films would have easily made my top 10 list had I actually watched them. I've been playing catch up for the last couple of months. I've managed to make a solid top 10 list and I'm just going to set it in stone so I don't have to keep putting off this, putting this off, put this, put it off any longer. So here are my top 10 films of 2018 from the ones that I actually saw. Mandy. Directed by Panos Cosmatos, Mandy is a psychedelic revenge film starring Nicolas Cage at possibly his most psychotic, except for the Wicker Man. Not the beast! Ah! My friend Clement described this as what a heavy metal album would look like in film form. I think that pretty much hits the Nine Inch Nail on my head. Are they heavy metal? I don't. I don't know. It's bloody horrific yet gorgeous. It plays with form and convention in a really refreshing and horrible way. It's oddly satisfying in a very macabre sense. It's no surprise as well that I developed a real itch to listen to heavy metal. Fun fact, I actually write essays really fast when listening to kind of heavy metal music. I wrote my most recent English essay in probably half the time it normally takes just with some guy going raw in my ear. Uh, not my tutor or the English, well the English supervisor actually was quite angry with how long it took me to, to come up with my focus questions so maybe they would have been more, I, I, it's not important, the important thing is that Mandy is a great film. So I give Mandy seven rocks out of, out of ten rolls. Still cool, still cool kids. I'm still cool. Number nine. The favourite. I've been a big fan of Hollywood's most idiosyncratic player since The Lobster and seeing Lanthimos finally find a way of maintaining his unique approach to filmmaking but also adhering to the conventions of Hollywood really worked for me. Particularly considering it was a period piece. I typically can't get behind the, the big dresses and the, the set design. It doesn't really do anything for me. Seeing Sophie from Peep Show give, well, literally an Oscar-worthy performance. Uh, well, just kudos to the whole cast, in fact. Uh, everyone from Emma Stone to Rachel Weisz to Lazarus from Doctor Who. Good, good job. Good job, everyone. Well done. My only real grievance with it is the fisheye shots, which I don't know, it felt a bit more like style over substance for me. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe I missed a whole thing, but yeah, it didn't work for me. But regardless, I give the favourite a 7.9 out of 10. 7, not quite an 8, 7.9. It's like red on that side and then blue for lightsabers. 8, the director and the Jedi. So this might be a bit weird for a top 10, um, 
But just hear me out. The Director and the Jedi is a documentary that goes behind the scenes of Ryan Johnson's first entry in the Star Wars universe, The Last Jedi. It's a DVD extra and I love watching these kind of behind the scenes things, even commentary. But they always make me feel a little bit intimidated by the kind of scale of these productions. Not only was it great to get an insight on one of my favourite Star Wars films, but the behind the scenes didn't feel that intimidating to me. In fact, I kind of felt like I could do that. I could I could do a feature film from watching it. Not entirely sure that was the intention, but I felt alongside them, the director Ryan Johnson and producer Ram Bergman. It felt welcoming, almost. And also so fascinating to see how just up against it they were, right from the start. I mean, production-wise, creatively, budget-wise, time framing. They still managed to challenge the form and make a fresh take of Star Wars. I know there's a lot of debate about how good The Last Jedi is, but I just think it's all pretty dumb, so please don't comment on my Instagram asking me to re remake this, this top 10 video, um, because apparently that's a thing now. Anyways, I give the director and the Jedi four snowflakes out of five. Uh, I cannot do this snowflake! Number seven, bow. Ba bow. Bow. Right, so I never specified there had to be feature films, and quite frankly, Bao was so good that I felt obliged to give it some sort of nod. I'm not going to say anything about Bao in case I spoil it, except for that I saw it in America with Taha before The Incredibles 2, and then when I got home, I went to see The Incredibles 2 again with my family, uh, mainly just to see Bao, and me and my mum just sat there and bawled our eyes out, like proper, proper bald. Bowled. Proper, proper Bao. It's, it's, I thought there was a pun there, but it's nothing really quite there. So I'm gonna give Bao four dumplings out of five metaphors. Number six, eighth grade. Number six, eighth grade. The directorial debut for Bo, oh my god, Mr. Burnham, Mr. Mr. Burnham, was exactly as good as I expected it to be, which is, yeah, yeah, pretty good. Fair enough. Fair. Good. There's definitely some room for improvement, but for the most part it was a truly heart-wrenching and enjoyable indie film. I relate so hard to Kayla's relationship with YouTube, her teachings and wise words, which ultimately are just for her to hear and do, her to act upon, and also just shouting into that void so you finally feel like you're not alone in this godforsaken deep and emotionless world. The facelessness of the camera that stares back at you whilst you talk to often no one, no one's listening, no one's out there just because you're prying for something, something that can take you out of this chronic loneliness that makes you feel like, like nothing. Yeah, I really like the film. Yeah, that was good. My only issue is there is one character who doesn't get the punishment I feel he deserves, or even a hint of some sort of penance uh, or punishment through the rest of the film. But actually that could be a commentary on the kind of patriarchy film world we inhabit, and actually the, the failing to get punished for those deeds is, is a greater critique of the whole system. And if that's the case, then oh my god, Bo, Mr. Mr. Burnham, you've done it again. Flawless, eight out of eight, great film. Would watch again. Okay, black and white, baby. Number five, Roma. Our film lecturer told us this was the perfect film and loved it so much that he let us rent out the cinema room so we could all watch it. And yeah, it's banging. It is the first of two films on this list that just made my jaw just drop open. Uh, and it took me a few seconds to even realize. I don't want to spoil it if you haven't seen it. So I'm just going to talk like you have seen it, but there's someone also in the room who hasn't seen it yet and we don't want to spoil it for them. So it's that bit where he, and she's, but she's, and then she sees it, and then he, but then he, and he, but he does and, right? <laughs> that bit. <laughs> I give Roma an eight out of 10. But, but it's in it's in black and white because it's black and white black and white film. Cool. Number four, Thunder Road, the feature. So technically, I saw this film in cinemas two weeks ago, but technically, it did originally come out in 2018 in the US. So basically, it's real good, and I don't want to have to wait a whole year just to talk about it because I love it. Thunder Road is directed by Jim Cummings, not the voice of Winnie the Pooh, and is about a policeman officer's personal breakdown after his mother's funeral and his divorce. We were lucky enough to have a Q&A with the director after the screening, and he also introduced it by saying, "It's." Okay to laugh and it's okay to cry. Didn't realize it was okay to do both at the same time, 
but <laughs> here we are. It is a wonderful film. It was so well written, performed and edited, which is saying something because they were all done by the director. It was shot on a tiny budget in 15 days and at no point does it feel that way because it's shot with these wonderful long takes. It's a great example of the kind of film I aspire to make one day. In fact, it got the balance between tragedy and comedy that we ourselves aspired to get in our final year uni film so perfectly, more so than we did. No, oh, it's fine, I'm not annoyed, it's fine. But yeah, I really hope this film sticks with you as much as it has stuck with me. Please go out and see it if you can. I think it's still in select cinemas, uh, and I'm giving Thunder Road 8.5 tiers out of 10. Okay, so I'm gonna do my list of honorable mentions now because the top three films I've selected are so close together, they can easily interchange. Definitely have at some point. Just depends on my mood and what time of the day you ask me. Robocop, give me the honorable mentions. Tully, Revenge, Free Han Solo, American Animals, Ice Cream, Skate Kitchen. Sorry to bother you. Boot Riley's directorial debut stars Lakeith Stanfield and Tessa Thompson and is about a telemarketer who discovers the secret to succeeding in his career, his white voice. Was fortunate enough to uh, attend a Q&A with, uh, with old Boots Riley, pal, my pal, my good friend Boots. Boots. He explained at the Q&A that he wanted to make the most communist film he possibly could. And yeah, I think he, yeah. No, yeah. It's funny, yet sincerely political when it needs to be, with one of the most unique voices in cinema of 2018, maybe of the whole teenies, is it teenies? The last 10 years, decade, decade. Whilst it does take some batshit crazy turns narrative wise, it still follows the core rules of storytelling and it foreshadows a lot of that weird stuff very effectively. It, it personally works for me and I hope it works for you at home. It sounds like a blue Peter presenter. Anyway, it's hard to think of a film like it, and its often heavy-handed approach to the telling of truths is a real reminder of the possibilities of art house cinema. I give Sorry to Bother You 850 out of 1,000. Cool. And on to the next one. Go, I'll go change the vinyl. Number two. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. When a killer shark unleashes chaos on a beach community, it's up to a local sheriff, a marine biologist, and an old seafarer to hunt the beast down. I love Spider-Man. Did you know? I love Spider-Man. I used to make Spider-Man fan films when I was little, my first camera, which is actually my grandparents' camera. But this film, it bleeds creativity. It's a fine example of a team who are clearly passionate about a project, who are willing to go that extra step to push themselves creatively and stylistically, and it, it's groundbreaking. Lord and Miller are at the helm of this creative enterprise, and yes, they took some risks in the fourth wall breaks, and I guess some of the narrative points can be a bit weaker, but they took a leap of faith and it really paid off. I like the Lego movie on paper. I've never quite engaged with it like a lot of my friends or colleagues have, but Spider-Verse, I finally get it. I finally get the, f the Lord and Miller effect. That's, that's what I'm gonna label it, the Lord and Miller effect. Spider-Verse made me feel like a kid again, holding my camera sideways so that I'm not crawling, I'm, I'm climbing. Just see the film, it's wonderful. It deserves all the love and praise it's getting. I give Spider-Verse Nine spiders out of ten men. Number one, you were never really here. This was the second film on this list that made my jaw just drop open. Only once it dropped, it did not stop. It it, it didn't it didn't go back. It didn't go back to default. It's easily the rawest film of uh, 2018, and for me, the most emotionally harrowing from its rustic cinematography to its beautiful score by the Radiohead OG Johnny Greenwood. I felt a lot of things watching this film. I'm just going back to that image of me sat in the cinema with my jaw open for the entire third act and then, I mean I normally sit through the credits because I'm a massive nerd but I was just frozen to my seat just trying to process what I'd seen. I love this film. I love this film. Wacken Phoenix is is pretty incredible in the role, but I mean, we're, we're kind of used to that now with Wacken Phoenix. It wasn't a surprise, but it was a welcome addition to my favorite film of 2018 that I've seen. And there's one scene involving a lake which blew me away and it's gonna stick with me for 
a very long time, and I, I'm giving You Were Never Really Here an A out of 100. Thinking about that film really takes it out of me. Um, but that was my, my top 10 films of 2018 that I saw. Let me know if any of the films I listed in my top 10 spoke to you, or if any of the films I listed at the start are worth watching. I hear that Bohemian Rhapsody and Green Book especially are real, real crowd pleasers. Cool, 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 cool. If you like this video, just, just shout, just shout at your device. Just shout like, like really loud. I'll know. Coming back at you after like seven, seven, seven months. Not good. Need to improve that schedule. Okay.